It's now two o'clock. I'll call this work session of the Gilman County Board of Commissioners to order. And we'll begin. There's a, a slight change in the order of business today due to uh, Commissioner Hitson's schedule. So we're going to begin today instead of with the CD, the finance director, we're going to begin with Chris Hildreth, the infrastructure and development director, and he's going to give us his report and talk about capital planning. There he is. Thank you, Chair. Hey, Commissioner. So uh, it's good to be back in front of you again. We do this every year, just give you a review of where we're at. We'll talk about the enterprise fund and public utilities. Uh, just as a uh, review, we'll talk about our service area and uh, what we do, who we serve, and what our revenue is for that right now we'll go over the revenue trend then look at the expense trending as well and see how they compare see where the uh how we compare to some metrics that the state lgc sets that they like to see and of course we'll talk about staffing i think you'll hear a lot about that um later today and uh then we'll talk about rates and uh Show you where they would need to go if we want to um if we want to come close to meeting those benchmarks that um that the state set so begin with we uh we own and operate a six million dollar i mean six uh million gallon water treatment plant hydro road in mount gilead we serve uh, a little over five thousand five hundred retail residential customers uh a little over 140 retail commercial customers and the bulk of our water probably 35 percent of it is sold to the bulk buyers of municipal towns uh six towns and two um uh subdivisions on lake tillery and you can see right there at the uh at the bottom is kind of a rate table for uh different uh, amounts of water consumed residential uh, uh, we'll talk about this a 5,000 gallon average bill uh, residential right now we're at 41 and commercials at $75 uh, the bulk rates are just 299 and 319 for the uh, for the subdivisions when you look to how we compare to those around us in the North Carolina median not the average but the half as many utilities have a higher rate for 5,000 gallon build and 3593 and a half have a lower rate. We're at 41, a little bit above average, but as you can see there, we're a little over halfway down the list. Uh, commercial is at the bottom. Commercial, we have a uh, pretty significant, pretty high commercial rate already. $38 minimum, $7.40 a thousand, but yet again, $75 for 5,000 gallon build. In the past, we've had a couple of rate increases. 2013 with the uh, alum sludge and raw water intake and high service pump projects, um, we needed to get with the towns and negotiate, and we were successful at, uh, in, at a negotiated rate of 2.99. And we had uh, small rate increases through for uh, retail, the rural customers too, residential. Uh, However, most of that gain, most of those gains, that brought in an extra six hundred thousand dollars a year. But most of that was eat up with uh, debt service and operational cost increases for those brick and mortar uh, improvements. Two thousand seventeen, we did another rate increase. It was more of an adjustment um, to, in order to position ourselves to get fifty percent grant eligibility for the uh, projects that were being funded by DWI. Um, and most of that, you can see by the next slide, most of that uh, didn't bring in that much more money, but um, it did bring in a little bit, but it's flattened out. Okay. So here's, here's the problem. Uh, you can see it uh, pretty evident after 2017, our revenue is flatlined. Um, so the past four years, it's actually lower than it was four years ago. And so you'll notice from the next slide, 
when we talk about expenses, that that's not matching up well with what's happening with expenses. Really what you would expect to see, a, a slow uh, trend upward uh, in operational costs. The blue uh, area is our operational costs. The orange area is our debt service. You can see it's gone down just a tick when the high service pump, uh, the five year term on the high service pump came off. And then the gray is our depreciation. And so when we compare both, anytime you see that green line dipping below your expense line, there's an issue. And here's where the state recommends, it's called an operating ratio, including depreciation. State recommends a, a 1.2 ratio, meaning that your revenues are 120% of your expenses, your operational expenses, your debt service, and your depreciation. Right now, we're a little bit less than one. So we are, we're not covering what we need to cover if we want to reinvest in the system and keep it viable for years to come. So expenses are creeping up, operational expenses. Your revenue is flatlined. And I will give you an example of how those operational expenses are going to continue to go up and also your debt service is going to go up with the projects that we have uh, already funded and then the, the rest of the needs we have as well. Um, it's kind of out of order so I was hoping to get the, uh, the HR's presentation in before, before mine but uh, you're going to hear some horror stories from HR and you're going to hear some horror stories from the sheriff and from Brian with 911 operators, how you, you know it's hard to get employees and to keep employees, but I can promise you they are not dealing with what I'm dealing with down there. They, they've got problems, but we've got bad problems. We haven't been fully staffed since 2008, I mean 2018. It's been over two years. We have five water treatment plant positions funded. We have two of them staffed. These two have worked an average of you know, over 100 hours per pay period for the last six, my last year, for the last year. And, and Crystal, the, one of them worked that for the last two and a half years. Have to have, have, to have certifications. I'm, you know, I'm advocating for uh, some forgiveness on, on the state's part on some of that, but we'll work that angle too. But have to be at least C-Surface certified, and we have to have at least our ORC, our Operator and Responsible Charge, has to have an A-Service license. So we don't have a choice. We can hire somebody without a license, but they don't do us any good. We're working on, with part-time people for the last two years and contract, uh, contract help. And so we just, you know, it's impossible to find, you know, a qualified applicant. Uh, even if you get one that's not qualified or that is qualified, they're not interested in coming to Montgomery County. You can see up there our current pay scale, you know, our salaries, where our work plan operator A with the A license is barely making above the five county uh, minimum, surrounding county the minimum. Uh, she does have an A license. The second one is a C license, but uh, he's not quite at the five county minimum. Even if we reach the mid range, it would, I would argue, it'd be tough to get some, to entice somebody to come here work when they can work in Charlotte or work in even Stanley County or Randolph County. Uh, so it is a challenge, uh, but we've been dealing with it for two years. It costs us more on an annual basis, uh, but it's, it's not worth um, going to a full-time contract operations by no means yet, but um, uh, we're making do the best we can. I know they're tired, uh, but those are, those are two good employees you have work for the county and they've been doing it for a while. So if we do anything about it, it's gonna cause the operational expenses to go up. Even if we don't, the operational expenses are gonna to continue to climb up at a, you know, a small rate, uh, it, just as things get more expensive. And the second thing that's gonna keep going up is, is the debt service or the amount of money reinvestment we've got to put into the system. Um, you got one through four that is funded right now, and five through six are just an example of 
future projects that need to be funded and critical things that need to be done. Uh, we just had a leak on, not on Wright Road, Clayola Road, but it reminded me of that, Saunders Road. Uh, we have a leak like every two months on Saunders Road. And that's because the line was installed, it's a thin wall pipe installed on rock. So it was poor installation, poor oversight when it was going in. And we constantly are out there with service outages and our guys are working overnight to fix these these lines. But um, anyway, the, the debt's not going anywhere. And the projects aren't going anywhere. They're just going to be constant. And so, if we're, the legislature just passed the session law, it was 2020-79, that uh, basically tasked the, uh, the DWI and the local government commission to review utilities and enterprise funds uh, at least once every two years and identify those that are being distressed or that are in distress, meaning that they're not meeting their revenue to be able to perform operation maintenance and management of the systems. Um, so our position is not unique, and in order for us to not be one of those distressed um, utilities that basically have to, they put you through the paces about, you know, educating you everything you need to do and, you know, make you really evaluate uh, mergers and regionalizations and anything think outside the box anything you can do to make it viable again and so in order to kind of stay off their radar you need to get to that operation ratio of 1.2 and that actually means 2.3 million dollars annually in additional revenue that'd be a hard pill to swallow for most of our ratepayers in one year so I tried to give an example of how we could get there. So back to the operating ratio. Basically, you need to increase, increase your revenue, like I said, $2.3 million. If you divided that over four years, $575,000 a year in additional revenue. Based off of total volume of water sold, that would be $270,000 a year per year for the next four years increase for residential customers. $92,000 for commercial and $212,000, $213,000 a year for four years for bulk. Uh, you spread that out, look at what it means to our five, look at what it does to our 5,000 gallon uh, average bill. Right now, 220, two, year 2020, costing our customers $41. To meet that benchmark, we have to raise in 2021 and go up $3. 2022, go up to $49. 2023, go up to $54. And by 2024, we meet that 1.2. Our average $5,000 bill costs $59 a month. Now, there are some systems out there right now that that have that kind of uh, that kind of rate. It seems it seems a little um, large to begin with, but um, I think uh, we'll get used to seeing uh, higher water water and sewer rates in the future. Commercial would have to go up from seventy five dollars for five thousand gallons to ninety eight seventy five. Our municipal bulk rate would need to go up from two ninety nine to step up to three, 342, it's basically 43 cent every year. This is if we keep selling the same amount of water. Hopefully we will have some, uh, have some economic development and some residential growth out on the river and we'll start uh, gaining more customers and, and selling more water and we can kind of mitigate this a little bit. But uh, that's what the picture looks like if we wanted to catch up to it in four years. Uh, the non-governmental bulk rate is just the same step, just uh, starting with 319 instead of 299. And that also, that also is converting to a minimum bill with 2,000 gallons. Uh, if you still use no zero gallons, you just have a tap out there in the meter, uh, still trying to keep that rate low. Um, eight, I mean, $12 now would go up to $20. But that's using zero water. As soon as you use the first drop of water, well, I start using the minimum bill that we can, we can creep up the minimum bill, but we're gonna to have to give them, you know, 2,000 gallons for it as it goes up. So it's, it's 
there's a lot built into the rate structure there, but um, it, and we can play around with it multiple ways. But the bottom line is, is it's 2.3 million dollars that is our deficit right now. Chris, you didn't include the new storage uh, requirements for the lake and east side. We need storage tanks, right? For elevated storage tanks. Yeah, we des desperately need some in, in Waitville, too. But that wasn't in your plan, was it? No, that, it was just an example of projects. I mean, I, that one, the CIP, I just <clears throat> threw in a couple of examples. Well, for the benefit of uh, next year's and subsequent boards, uh, you might go over what our requirements are for elevated storage and about how much that cost. Because if we're going to see economic development, you're going to have to yeah, the requirement is um, half a day. Uh, I'm trying to remember the exact number. Right now, when you look at our system overall and look at all our storage tanks that we have, we're at the minimum. So we, we have enough storage. But when you look at individual hydraulic zones, like along the lake along, you know, and, and quite frankly in Wadeville, if you look at them independently, we don't have enough storage. There needs to be you know, at least half a million gallon tank in, in Wadeville and probably the same along the river subdivisions too. And we're gonna need, if we ever develop over in the interstate, you're gonna need more storage there. Mm -hmm. Troy has got a million gallons in there right now. And then uh, we have 300,000 elevated on Dairy Road. There's a and lot in the area, but. For a, say, a 300,000 gallon elevated tank would cost about how much? 300, probably 1.5 right now. I think the, I think you could count on 1.5 to 2.5 million dollars, depending on the size. And the 500 gallon would be closer to 2.5 million. So like I said, to support economic development, you're gonna need probably at least two more tanks at the cost of roughly $5 million. Mm -hmm. And have to figure out how to fund somehow. And we, you know, we can't sit on Booster Station Two either. The original plan was to do redo both. Uh, thankfully, Division of Water Infrastructure allowed us to use the million dollar grant and the million dollar loan for just one. It's, you know, we you know we spent over a year bidding that, so um, we still have two Station Two to do. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> Chris, why don't you tell that monitor so the people in this side can see? Next, we have uh, Brian Helms coming to talk about broadband. He's our communications director. I appreciate you guys having me. Uh, ever since I've worked here, broadband has been a discussion since 2005, uh, October of 2005. Uh, I got <clears throat> into the discussion six or seven when they wanted to add some uh, connectivity along the lake um, north of Wood Run and we were able to connect CenturyLink and their homeowners association uh, together and that worked out. That was one of the easier ones unfortunately for us as we said. It's very important for economic development for our schools as we know all our kids are online. The two of mine that are still in school are struggling to get connected and um, not due to our connectivity, but for other reasons. But those that are out in un underserved or unserved portions of the county are struggling and are at the risk of getting left behind. So this is an important discussion for us to have. 
the internet providers in the county, CenturyLink's the overall provider, as pretty much everybody knows uh, that's from here. LRB Telephone touches a portion of Jackson Springs. Randolph Communications, um, they have a presence in the Baden Lake area, as well as fiber that runs down 109 to the UI River and part, uh, northern portions of Ophir Road. That is their primary footprint into the county. Uh, River Street Networks is kind of new to our area. They bought out a wireless service that LRB Telephone had been operating. Uh, before that, it was another provider who the county back in uh, 2008, 2009, uh, we entered an agreement with the original wireless operator to have access to our water tanks in the county, and they built out a network, which is still there. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't expanded out much beyond the towns. Um, they are in a portion of um, on Lake Tillery, um, but that's pretty much the only area, and I think there's an area of, of a small bit of coverage up 134 that they expanded out to. Uh, they have, we still have an agreement with them. They have access to all our water tanks. Um, and like I said, River Street has just bought this out from LOB Telephone, so they're still uh, getting the game plan together uh, as to what they're going to do for our community. Spectrum has recently rolled out <laughs> more um, coverage in Troy. Troy was one of the only markets in the state that. Uh, charter who was the former provider had that they only provided video one-way service no no internet so spectrum has rewired most of the town they're providing internet uh, they also provide internet on the east side of the county as well as uh, the Mount Gilead area and up the lakes um, up to 2427 uh, HughesNet that's a satellite provider uh, we wanted to throw that in there because that is a uh, something that everyone has access to. It's not the most cost effective, but it does cover all of our residents. But there's a major affordability, which we'll get into later on here. So there's three levels of service here, and the FCC back in 2015 upped the definition of broadband. Back then it was four megabit download speed and speeds and one up. By today's standards, that is, that's horrible to think that's what we operated at, but that was acceptable in those times. So now it is 25 megabit download and three up, which means that not all of our county falls into the definition of broadband just because they have internet service. A lot of times we use broadband as a broad stroke to say that's they have internet service, but True definition of broadband is 25 meg up, or download, three megabit upload. So we've got a graph here. What we did was we took the numbers from the FCC maps, which are the most, they're, they're not the most accurate maps, but they're, they're all the data that we have to work on. So we took those maps of the county and we took our address point layer from 911 addressing and we overlaid the two and we come up with, with the percentages. And in a further slide, you'll see the exact numbers. 7%, according to these maps, of our residents have less than 10 meg coverage. Less than 10 meg is considered a borderline no access because of the limitation of what, what you can do with that kind of bandwidth um, in today's world. Uh, yeah, you can watch a YouTube video um, the upload speeds are prohibitive of doing much in the way of video conferencing. So school kids that are needing to do Zoom meetings, which is what my middle schooler, is, that's how their classes are ran, they're going to they're gonna have problems. Um, and it's, it's 10 megabit or less, a lot of these areas, just by looking at the map, I would, I would put... <laughs> I would guess that they are, are trending on the less than 10 meg end, not the upper end of this scale. 41% of our folks, mostly in rural areas outside of town, again, there's a map coming up so it'll better define it, have that 10 to 24 meg service. 
uh, that percentage is higher mainly because of Spectrum's uh, footprint along the lake as well as the Baden Lake area being served by Randolph Telephone uh, and the town. And, and so some of those areas overlap outside of towns. The 52% is the over 25 meg, which you're getting into the core of Spectrum and uh, as well as Randolph Telephone's coverage area that that's where the majority of our um, our population, our address points, which represents houses, households, are going to fall. Um, the order of our priority, obviously, to, to resolve the problem is going to be uh, we're going to try to find a solution for the 7% group um, followed by the rest. Um, the 7% group is spread out amongst the county which brings us to our next, our underserved population. It's less than 10 maybe. Uh, I won't read it, but it, they're, they're spread out all over the county. The reasons they're spread out all over the county, uh, if you want to delve into the technical reasons of it, which I won't bore you with, uh, back when telephone service was, was uh, the primary interest of our telephone companies, they put up pedestals. You see these sometimes on the side of the road. They're just equipment. Sometimes they have fences around them. Uh, a lot of times they have a label, CenturyLink or whatever on them. That's where all the phone lines that come into your houses connect back to. They're centralized locations. And then those areas are connected back to other central locations in the county. And that's how they roll out their network. Well, years ago, before internet, all they cared about was voice. Well, you can send voice a long ways down a, down a piece of copper. Uh, when the internet became a, a thing, uh, the uh, technology was developed to push internet over these lines, which is DSL. That's what everybody knows and most people have in the county. DSL was a workaround so that the county, the phone companies didn't have to replace that infrastructure and could reuse it. And so all the infrastructure is still wired back into those pedestals and it was all designed around a voice network. You can send DSL down about 18,000 feet under ideal conditions of line. Well, that's not very far. So what you end up with, if you draw a circle, and that's a crude representation around all these pedestals in the county, you end up with, with uh, empty spots in between these circles. That's why our underserved populations are just sparsely, uh, in, uh, just throughout the county, you find these areas of, of no internet coverage. They're not, it's just not one area. And, and that's why, that's why it's like that. Um, that comes back to the infrastructure, the population density in a rural county just doesn't exist for these folks to have to come in and run all new infrastructure. And, and that's, that's the war, that's the battle that we're fighting is it really comes down to dollar and cents. How many houses per mile do you have? And what's the return on the investment for uh, a telco or internet provider or whatever without any, um, any outside funding? How are they gonna make their money back? What's the business model? And to provide affordable internet, you know, you can provide internet at any cost, but you gotta provide it affordably. And unfortunately in rural areas, you'll find that Rural areas have the least affordable internet of anywhere. You can go into an urban area and buy internet much cheaper, or bandwidth much cheaper than you can in a rural area. Our second tier, if you want to call it that, that we put together is a 10 meg to 24 meg. These are the households that are located within that, that I know I've said 18,000 feet. Those are the people that are living a little bit closer to the pedestals, um, people that are living closer in, maybe outside of town, but they're closer into town, close enough that they're getting higher speed internet, but they can't get the high speed internet. So um, once again, that's 41% of our, of our population. These percentages, once again, are all based on that FCC data, which is a broad stroke. There, there is, discrepancies in that data and you know when you see the map you know people folks that are familiar with the county 
are probably going to say, well, you know, that, that area there, I know they can't get that speed. Once again, we're using the most accurate data that we have access to. Um, we're going to the 24 meg or above, uh, mostly towns, lakes, the Baden Lake area. Um, I live in Troy. I have 100 meg internet. I can get 400 meg at my house. Uh, you know, we don't have a problem here, but the folks outside of town do have a problem. The reason that spectrum is here is because the, the household density in Troy. The reason they're on the lake is because of the household density. And there's more people per mile that are willing to pay for the service. Um, when I had CenturyLink, it cost me about $80 a month to have internet only at 10 meg. I've got 100 meg now at less than 70. So it's more affordable and less cost. If I lived down Troy Cander Road, just a few miles, and I live on the east side of Troy, then that internet, that 10 meg may not even be available, but I'm still gonna end up paying $80 a month. Just because I'm just a few miles from where I geographically am located now. And it's because of the, the distance from those central telephone, that infrastructure. Here's the map. Um, 11,259 addresses that are in the green. Um, looking at the green, you can kind of see the green areas of the map, rather. Uh, you can, you can kind of get an idea of what it's following. Um, around Mount Gilead, that's all spectrum for the most part. Some of it is CenturyLink, but uh, CenturyLink in town can offer, they can give you 80 meg service in town. Uh, that's because of the proximity to their central office. They have central office locations in each town. And so they can offer a lot faster rates because of that and because the wiring tends to be better in towns than it is in rural, in the rural parts of the county. Some of the wiring in the rural parts of the county probably dates back to the 50s when it was originally installed. So we're still using that same twisted pair that was plowed into the ground or ran on the poles many, many years ago. So our topics of discussion, how do we serve the 7%? Uh, how do we improve the rural areas that are at that mid-level of service that are less than the definition of broadband, which is an ever-changing thing, it's a moving target. In the next five years, that number is probably gonna change to 50 plus million. And it's gonna change faster than we can get infrastructure in the ground. So. This, which we're, this is we're at the beginning of a, a multi-year process to, to roll out service that will keep up with that ever-changing landscape of how much bandwidth we need to serve for educational purposes, for economic development purposes. Um, you know, the third one, which is the biggest problem that I see in our county is how to address those that have access but can't afford internet connectivity. Uh, the county cannot put in infrastructure for broadband. We're prohibited by our state. State of Virginia doesn't have that limitation. There's broadband projects going on in rural Virginia where local entities are, are dumping millions of dollars into subsidizing broadband projects because they see that the payout is there for rural areas. So, uh, going back through, I kind of jumped ahead of myself a little bit. Uh, what can we do to provide to those without? Uh, state law that, that was put in place in 2019, uh, Senate Bill 310, allows electrical co-ops to run, uh, run infrastructure for broadband, as well as get funding, broadband funding from federal entities. Uh, and as of right now, we, we have spoke with someone from Randolph Electric. Uh, River Street Networks, is, is, is they're telling me that they're working with PD Electric. I don't know that that's the part that's in our county, but there are possibilities for those areas. 
Randolph covers uh, a good portion of our county that could benefit um, PD as well. River Street Networks, they are a, they are buying up small telephone company footprints all over the place in eastern North Carolina. Uh, they can provide wireless internet, they can provide fiber to the home. Uh, they specialize in partnering with small counties like ours and they, they have a broad knowledge of what kind of federal funding is out there and they have the staff that, that can go after them. Uh, they also have equipped, they have a network already in our county. They, they have roots here. So I've been speaking with those guys about what, what we can do. To provide services to those little pieces of the uh, map that, are, that were read, um, which I don't know if I explained that 100%, I'm gonna go back real quick. <laughs> Sorry about that. The green areas are, are well served. The tan or yellow areas are in between. The red areas are underserved. Once again, I apologize for skipping over that detail. So the red areas are scattered between all over the county. That is a, a good model for a wireless provider to come in and just hit those spots. The, the, because those spots are, are not very densely populated. Uh, if you look at the roadways they're on, they're, they're not densely populated at all. So that's where River Street could possibly help us. But the fiber, running fiber or coax with a spectrum type install is the only thing that's going to up the red and the yellow or tan areas in our county. That's the only way, as we are, sit right now, that is the only way to get those going. So mid-level, notice it's the same between how do we provide to those without, it's the same providers. Randolph Communications, they were able to run fiber down 109 and Ophir Road. Uh, if they have other footprints in the county, I'm, I'm not aware of it at this time. Uh, we had worked with them to try to get fiber ran down 134 uh, along with the town of Troy and we were unable to get, get that to work out. Uh, MCNC is another entity that provides backbone fiber to the county. They're uh, Stan, uh, someone representing uh, a representative of Stanley County contacted us a few weeks ago and asked if we'd be willing to, um, I guess, sponsor or, or at least partner with them to have an extension of the MCNC network to come through our county. Uh, there's a, they want to run a fiber from Midland to Bisco. That would increase connectivity in our county. Of course, we want to be part of that. Uh, their role would not be to serve broadband out to underserved areas, but rather to serve um, serve broadband as a backbone, a provider for the people who would serve broadband into the county. So how to improve mid-level areas, same players are going to be there. Uh, it's, it's a little different game at mid-level because the Century links of the world that provide DSL would have to rearrange their entire network to serve. And DSL is not going to be the technology that's going to do it. It's going to be fiber to the home or coax to the home. Th those are really the, the technologies that's going to allow us to improve the mid-level areas. The affordability piece is, a, is another problem. Uh, the schools estimate that 30% of their students reside in areas where they have internet, but they don't have connectivity due to financial limitations. Uh, with our current climate, kids are not in school, everybody's remote learning, that creates a huge problem. Um, they're dealing, they're looking at funding of 150 additional hotspots to help with that issue those are, those are going to be free for parents to take their kids to. Uh, but once again, that's a, 
that's a band-aid that's not a fix. We've set up hot spots at our buildings. We realize that most of those buildings are in Troy, but it, we already had the connectivity and the technology in place to flip that switch and you know we have public networks that folks can use. The library offers it at their locations. Uh, the USDA in the state of North Carolina is, is supporting, they're prioritizing rural connectivity because they realize that we have unique issues that, that urban areas do not have. And no one's going to want to move to a rural area if they can't get connectivity. Because how are they going to work? How, how, you know, it's, it's a modern, it's not a convenience anymore, it's a utility that everyone deserves. So, going to the last piece here, CARE, the CARES Act has uh, the round two funding provided to the county, $222,500. Uh, Matthew's gonna speak to that later on uh, at tonight's meeting about, I went back one, uh, about, did I go forward? Anyway. Uh, we're going to talk about providing that funding to the county schools or communities in schools to support mobile hotspots to the students. Uh, Mayor Allgood with the town of Troy is, has contacted the county and, and she's a big proponent of, of this. I haven't had direct communication with her myself, but I know she's a big proponent of this. Um, you know, the town of Troy, along with, uh, with their board, may be willing to do something. I don't know that for sure, but that's, that's an option. Uh, town of Bisco has also contact, uh, expressed interest in solving the issue. So that's, that's another possible solution in providing connectivity directly to the students. Uh, of course, there's still going to be areas where they may live somewhere where they don't have cell phone coverage. That's a secondary issue, but, but it is a solution that could get us closer to the end goal. One of those big pieces of that goal is, is getting students what they need. Uh, what we, uh, the ncbroadband.org, they have a, a process they recommend you go through. Um, our adoption of this process is that we need to do an engineering study, uh, mainly for the 7% and 41%, where we can, real, re, we realistically need to improve or can improve. This engineering study, uh, I mentioned the FCC maps are not 100% accurate. This engineering study would give us better data. It would give us a, a more, a, a clearer picture of where our assets are in this county, where different types of internet may be used to get to those 7% of households, whether that be wireless, fiber to the home, um, expansion of existing services, whether that be Spectrum or, or Randolph, they're, they're gonna look at all the providers and give us a, a comprehensive study of what we may be able to do. So. That is the county's ability to support broadband at this point financially is to have this study in place. That way we can identify partners. Step two, once we identify partners, those partners are gonna apply for grants with our support. And that's how we can get the federal money that's out there into our community and we have a lot of our, uh, a large portion of our county is eligible for those funds. We just can't go out and get them for ourselves. We have to have a partner. Uh, this, the, the larger providers are not as interested in rural counties because of the payback issue. Um, we can support legislation that would stop the prohibition of county involvement. Uh, one of those is House Bill 431, which has not really moved much since March, and that bill would allow counties to put in, in, in internet or broadband infrastructure and apply for grants directly. 
and then we could lease that to providers. Um, I checked on it before I came in here, and it still hadn't moved, and it was it was introduced sometime during the end of March. Uh, cooperatives can be formed. We can be part of that with some partners if we have. Uh, businesses or individuals in the county that are interested in forming cooperatives once again that engineering study would be the guidance for any cooperative that may want to form and we would have that and it would be publicly available uh, the engineering study we've got that in the fy21 proposed budget um, so preliminary you know, sixty to a hundred thousand uh, dollars. Facts, reality, facts. Current cost to run one mile of fiber is twenty-seven thousand dollars. That doesn't include the last mile connectivity, which is part of the problem with the seven percent. To be sustainable, you need thirteen connected paying households per mile. That's a major problem in our county. Now, on a lot of roads roadways and thoroughfares uh, 23 households per mile we know those are more densely populated in towns on the lake Wake County's 311 households per mile I won't read through the rest but you get the picture uh, it's not a rosy image and it's gonna take some uh, some skin in the game from us to make it happen. That's what it really comes down to. I put some links here on this. Uh, if anybody wants this, these are where a lot of this information came from. Um, I think I listed one of those twice. That is my fault. But anyway, any questions? So mm -hmm. you're saying this study would cost you say 60 to 100,000? Well, we would do an RFP, RFQ, or we would we would have to vet out the best option. Uh, that number comes with my conversation from River Street. Okay. Now, with that study, what you just talked about with the households per mile, would that study give them that information so that we could look at whether or not, or the provider could look at whether or not that's something they want to invest in? Yeah, that study would show, you know, where the households are, which we already have that data here in the house with okay. our address point, GIS mapping layer. Okay. So it puts a dot on every household. Some of those dots are buildings that have gotten an address, but majority of them are households. Uh, it would identify, you know, what what is the reality of connecting, you know, whatever portion of the county they're looking at uh, with fiber. What would be the cost of doing that? Would it be better served by wireless instead of a, when I say a wired connection, I'm not, I'm talking fiber or coax. Um, it would be the decision-making information that you would have as a broadband provider to look at, to say, okay, this is a profitable venture for me to go into. Um, Obviously, CenturyLink on a big scale is, and, and I shouldn't pick on them, but someone like them, I should say, is going to look at that and say, you know, we may be able to expand out in a few of these areas, but other than that, we're probably doing all we can do for the amount of revenue we've got coming in. A company like River Street, and there's several of those in the state, there's not many, but there's a few, would look at that and say, okay, we can take this project, we can get this federal or state grant which makes it prof profitable even though it's not profitable by billing just the you know however many dollars a month because they also have to make it affordable because if it's two hundred dollars a month with a five-year commitment no one wants no one's going to sign up for that right so to make it profitable based on our households and the income in our county for the households it would probably have to be almost like a mandatory sign-up process for it to make it profitable then. Well, that's it's not like public utilities, so yeah, it, you, yeah that wouldn't be possible. Um, but that's one of the challenges, you're right, is that not everybody's going to sign up. Because um, they can't afford that. 
yeah. sixty or seventy dollars a month or whatever. And certain communities, uh, you know better than I that that the folks in those communities, some of them need internet, some of them don't, and the ones that don't are not going to sign up. Uh, but then you got spots like a gentleman that contacted me at the end of Love Joy Road that wanted to open up some cabins and start a, a, a winery or some. Uh, this has been several years ago, so I don't have all the details, but he had no way of getting internet. So, you know, you can't have these things until you have internet. Unfortunately, the companies don't want to run internet until the demand is there, and so you're you, you're stuck without without subsidies from the state or the federal government. It's not going to happen in rural North, North Carolina. Carolina. Okay. Now, what about HughesNet? Does that cover the whole county? Or? Yeah, HughesNet is based on a satellite provider, mm -hmm. and so and I'll speak to this real quick. I won't go too far into it, but. If you've heard about Starlink, which is, is a new company that uh, is forming that where they recently SpaceX launched the satellites and you could see them. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that anyway. Uh, the satellites that provide internet for HughesNet are geosynchronous satellites. They're you know, tens of thousands of miles out in space, which creates a problem for the speed and what kind of data connections they can run. They're also expensive, they require contracts, and they have data limits, some pretty hard data limits. So that is, that's why HughesNet is not the best option. It's going to take several years for, for the companies that are using low earth orbiting satellites to come online. They're going to be able to provide more in the line of broadband speed once they do come online if it proves to be profitable and that service comes to market. Uh, I didn't mention that in the presentation because right now it's not sure. I've signed up for, uh, to be one of the trial customers or whatever, and I've not heard anything back in several months now. Um, but they're only doing it in certain markets. Uh, Verizon in some markets has started a program of offering home-based internet on their 4G network since they're installing 5G now they're rolling out the bandwidth on their 4G network to home users, but it's only a few states. It's very selective. It's uh, $40 a month for 25 meg internet, which meets the criteria of broadband. If you're a Verizon customer, it's $60 if you're not. Once again, we don't know if that's ever gonna be here, if it's ever gonna catch on, and it's only gonna serve the areas of our county that's, that are Verizon, covered by Verizon. What about the individual hotspots? Uh, I mean, I was looking online this morning, and several companies have, uh, if you're free and reduced lunch, $10 a month for uh, the hotspots. Is that something that would work better in the county? I mean, if they have internet coverage, AT&T offers that, uh, Verizon offers that. Uh, uh, they're, they're just devices that allow you to connect to the internet you know, mm -hmm. via Wi-Fi. In other words, if I bought an individual hotspot, I would have to have cell phone uh, coverage. Right? Yes, that's correct. Either at and or for Verizon. Do we know what kind of coverage we've got for the cell phone? In the you can pull the maps off of the individual provider's website. They're not 100% accurate. Uh, we use Verizon with the sheriff's office, which is the only ones that I have hotspots for right now. That's how they have connectivity in the car. And it covers most of the county. There's still spots it doesn't cover, but that's gonna be the same with any provider. Um, that is a viable plan. Our cost for hotspots for government is $38. That's for AT&T or Verizon. Uh, 38 per month, and that is unlimited. But I'm not familiar with the $10 plan, um, which would be probably funded through the schools or the... Well, Walmart has, for example, you can go to Walmart, it says, and get a hotspot, and you pay $10 a month for 
Is it Verizon or AT and T coverage? That Straight Talk. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I looked at Straight Talk's plans. The the problem with those is they are they're unlimited data till you hit the cap. It's a little bit of a advertising mm -hmm. scheme. Once you hit whatever their you know cap is, then you go down to a lower tier level of speed, which is well below the you know 25 meg threshold that we're shooting for. Yeah. So are you recommending we proceed with an engineering study? Or? I think if the county wants to take a serious look at solving the problem that everything that I've researched and read so far for anyone to take it seriously we need to have that engineering study in hand. I mean if, if it was profitable if they could make money they would be here. Of course, the immediate need is for the kids to, to attend school. And I guess when your numbers like 30% don't have broadband in their home. And like I said, there are probably programs. We were just looking online, there were multiple programs from different places for various criteria, but all of them had free and reduced lunches criteria that you get this low rates. Matthew, what do you think about the engineering study? Is that something we should consider going ahead with? Um, as Brian said, that's the process laid out by NC Broadband. Um, Brian has given us some facts there about what the costs are, about the number of households in those areas. Uh, what the cost would be for the provider to come in. Um, it, it, it's a changing game, uh, as you just said. It's a demand now for, for a lot of people because of COVID. Um, you don't know what the future is. It's changing very fast, as Brian just talked about, satellites over and above us. We're working with Stanley County to get MCNC. Uh, which is the state fiber backbone run through the county. Uh, hopefully we'll have an answer on that from the legislature next year to let them fund it. Um, that is somewhat of a game changer in that if you have that fiber backbone, the last mile providers can, you know, that's going to reduce their cost so they have to have less households per mile. Um, when you talk to these providers like River Street, and I don't want to single anybody out it's not going to help but they are already in the areas installing the infrastructure where they know the payback is they didn't necessarily have to have the studies there when Brian and I sat down and had those communications with them that hey we're already letting you use our water tanks and our high spots to, to get the coverage out you know can you come do for us what you're doing for them well, we'll get your study done. I, I'm not that naive. Uh, 27,000 people, 21,000 addresses, 52% are already being served. You look at the map and you can see what the population densities are and where the people with higher incomes are. Um, as Brian also mentioned, right now counties are prohibited from, from getting in the game and competing. Uh, for infrastructure and for customers and in private industry. The panels can do it. Um, I certainly don't want to poo poo internet for anybody, uh, but it, it is, it could be as much as $100,000 to have the study done. Um, Brian mentioned the, the second round of the CARES Act. In that round two, they wanted us to go back and give 25% of the money, even from the first round, to the towns. Um, you saw the numbers there that CD and Brian came up with. That's about a half million, we're over half million dollars. Um, at your figure of $10 a month, that may be a short-term solution. So, I mean, that's a decision for the board. It's ever-changing 
playing field. There's an immediate need right now. That hundred thousand dollars of that study could be added to CARES Act funds. We don't have a hundred thousand designated for that, do we? We've set aside money the last three years in the economic development fund. Uh, I think that was the point that the CD and Brian put in. Uh, Brian has capital replacement projects that are scheduled in his budget every year. He's willing to move some of those out a year to, to help with the cost. I mean, um, you know, the board has to prioritize what the needs are. And so the first slide here. Laptops and patrol cars and things are scheduled to be out. And I'm not saying that are going to get you laptops, but you know what I'm saying. Right. There's things that Brian can do. Put the car in purchase. That's everybody knows. He can make it happen. We can make it happen. We can push it all through money in that economic development. Along with the revenue neutral tax rate. Funds that were set aside for the growth. Possibly just under two percent. The county has looked at several uh, spots of the county. Average over the past seven years since the last year. And it's just as we have to do with everything. Um, you have to in addition to what the needs are, what the payback this, on those are. Uh, Revenue really neutral tax rate. We we'll also notice. And, and well, we'll, the there's no slide here, but we have also we estimated a five percent reduction in sales taxes to get to a total budget. Anything uh, else for Point seven million. If we look at the second slide now. And these are our nine categories of expenditures. The rough categories. The next few slides. I'll go into more detail on each of these slides. Right, each of these categories. We could do it several different ways. This is the primary uh, government fund. Consult the CD to find the focus of our discussion for, for budget purposes. Uh, on the next slide, uh, it transfers out the first category. Uh, just under three and a half million. That's where we take some of these three thirty-two point seven million and actually transfer those funds or those monies to another fund, another county fund, uh, for expenditure there. And you'll notice the on this slide we have uh, first the education tax of four cents, and then next uh, the one cent for, uh, for capital. And the next line is the one cent education tax for maintenance those go into separate funds and the third line is the sales taxes uh, that were adopted uh, several years back that also go into uh, the maintenance uh, for education uh, facilities uh, those do show substantial increases and that's uh, based on the uh, the increase high increase in the tax value and there's no revenue neutral uh, switch with this five cents. Uh, the fire protection fund, the fourth line there, $650,000, you will recall, uh, this is the, this will be the second year um, with our arrangement with our fire departments to give them $35,000 each. There's 10 of those plus uh, set aside some money for, for a fire truck. We're, we're still um, agreeing to buy two fire trucks per station uh, over several years. Next um, is the capital reserve fund for the county where we're, we have been setting aside some money there for future projects. Um, nothing's been decided yet, um, but there's been some, some ideas floated around for, for several different things. Um, the courthouse, for example, is 100 years old. A cooperative extension building, I think, is also 60 years old and or close to it. And there's been some other, uh, I think, ideas floated out there as well. Uh, the property tax reval fund um, is the next line. Uh, we have to set aside some monies for our next reval, which is, of course, eight years away. Um, and the next is a recreation support fund. Um, monies we get from URI, Environmental Republic Services, uh, mm -hmm. every year I go to recreation support. Um, you'll note at the bottom, I have a little note there. Those monies go to support individual teams and leagues in, in the area or in the county such as Dick to Youth, uh, softball, uh, baseball, football, soccer. The current level of, of uh, reserves in that fund is just over $200,000. Uh, the last line there is the TDA fund uh, with the newly reenacted occupancy tax. Um, uh, 
Uh, those monies will go also into a separate fund. Next slide. Uh, moving on, uh, the next category is our, is our debt. Uh, current debt payments are Green Ridge Elementary and the jail, uh, both built about uh, 12 years ago. Those uh, term uh, loans term in 2025, we have uh, five more payments, five more principal payments. Uh, and the third line is our QSCAB uh, for various school improvements. Uh, roofs were put on East the Mill, and, and I think basically about every school building in the, in the county was touched uh, with that $3 million loan and about $200,000 being paid back uh, each year, and plus interest. And you'll notice at the very bottom, the QSCAB interest reimbursement offsets um, uh, the interest, most of the interest on that QSCAB loan. And then the last line is just some services that we have to pay each year uh, to trustees on these loans. So about $2 million overall, $2.1 million overall in our debt. Next is our, our capital uh, projects. Um, Chris is supposed to be getting stuff ready. So, David, you step in there and see Chris's office and see if he's available to declare the portion of this. And so, we'll come back to that uh, slide. Um, next is our education expense. Uh, you'll notice there's no increase uh, to the schools, uh, has been that way for several years now, except for the teacher supplements mm -hmm. uh, we added last year. Um, same budget for, for this past several years. We have been increasing uh, the college about 8,000 a year, and, and this year um, we're projecting to increase 10,400, which will be um, 1,000 per employee. They have eight uh, employees that we support, plus some fringes, and you'll see that's uh, also the same uh, increase we're, we're proposing for our, our county employees as well as $1,000. Uh, per person, uh, and then anybody over 50000 uh, would be increasing a 2% salary, uh, which we I think is pretty standard. We've been doing that for a few years now. <coughs> and Chris is here. Chris, well, we were uh, talking about $800,000 as well in the budget for capital project. Yes. Thank you, Steve. Sorry about that. Um, just really a tip of the iceberg. Um, you can see where the admin building, the um, the roof we've been dealing with for uh, about a decade now, uh, putting it off while we did other other roofs. Um, the same thing with the cooperative extension building, exterior renovations. Of the the um, if we don't do something soon, the windows are just going to fall out of the place. Health department, mechanical, uh, regional install. We spend more than 25% of its value annually. Um, same thing with administration, mechanical, the chiller out there, we spent over 25% of its, its replacement cost as well. Um, we've got other needs. We've got parking lot needs. This parking lot here is going to have to be totally replaced, uh, not just an overlay. It's uh, so cracked up and the, the soils underneath it are, are getting shot as well. So, I mean, we. We're trying to put things off as long as we can, but at some point we'll have to uh, try to catch up as much as we can. Any questions about those four? Mm -hmm. What are we doing with the courthouse again now? Are we... The courthouse, we've already done a, a lot of renovations to the courthouse, just cosmetic stuff to buy time. Mm -hmm. We've also addressed the mechanical issues in, in the courthouse as well. Uh, prior to, uh, I believe, 2012, Davison Heating and Air, um, for some reason, took all the outside air dampeners or all the outside air duct off and disconnected them from the air handlers above the ceiling in the basement. And uh, that's where a lot of our uh, indoor air quality complaints were coming from since we since we've connected those back and introduced an outside air, we, we haven't had any complaints. But that chiller as well, it needs to be replaced. That, that's next on the list in the parking lot. Mm -hmm.
Tenth Capital, uh, Capital Education. Um, uh, the next slide uh, is uh, going into uh, the maintenance of our uh, fund uh, for education. We've added, uh, uh, back in June, you guys agreed to add $2 million to the schools uh, to work on a field house and storage facilities at the new high school. They're also using some funds to reimburse uh, for some improvements they made at East Middle. And they have uh, you know, just over $2.2 million there. Uh, college has about $900,000 there. After adding the $500,000 in June, uh, most of the, what that's going to go for is the uh, sustainable farming for agricultural <coughs> education and various other, various other small, smaller projects. They're, they're, you know, sidewalk improvements, window replacements, they're, they're usually doing those kind of things. Uh, next we'll talk about uh, the departmental uh, expenditures. There's uh, two uh, slides here. This is about half of the budget in this, uh, this fund. Um, you notice on this particular sheet, I think it may be two slides in your uh, handout or in your in your presentation in your uh, file. Um, but at the very bottom, uh, there's about a one million dollar decrease that we've seen in this particular part of the budget over the past several years. Most of that is due to uh, social services uh, when the state took over daycare and uh, Medicaid transportation uh, payments. Other than, than that decrease in social services, there's been approximately $120,000 increase overall. There's several decreases, as you'll see in the first column, or the second column changed uh, since the fiscal year 17. Um, but there's also some positive facilities management, for example. And we've taken over the, the first old first bank building, what I'm calling the courthouse extension, because um, probation and parole down there, as well as elections. And, um, Obviously, utility costs have gone up. Um, the jail uh, has been a big increase in, in medical costs for inmates. And animal services, uh, is, uh, back in June, is another uh, agreement uh, or change we're making to animal services, uh, expanding, expanding their role in animal welfare and promotion. Um, those are the large items. Uh, and the next slide I have is talking about salaries uh, and, and personnel costs for, for these departments. Uh, again, a $1,000 increase is being proposed for those who make 50000 or less and a 2% increase for those who make over $50,000. In total, uh, the proposed salaries are just under 320000 more than they were in last year's budget, fiscal year 20 budget. Uh, the total cost there were about $500,000 more than the fiscal year 20 budget. Uh, 120,000 of that's from retirement. Uh, the state is increasing the percentage of the, uh, that the county is required to, to contribute to retirement each year. Um, and feel free to interrupt and ask me questions anytime. Uh, my next slide is talking about the allocations uh, as we near the last of the categories and expenditures. In this uh, uh, slide, there's $293,000 decrease overall. There's a, uh, most of that is because of no contribution in this budget for economic development. We've been setting aside some funds for several years got to about um, 1.5 million dollars actually set aside right now and so uh, but there's nothing included in this budget uh, for that um, and then there's a, a slight grant increase uh, uh, there you'll, and you'll see some other small changes there uh, school government dues association dues uh, there's a two thousand dollar decrease in the community buildings if you'll recall we gave two community buildings away this year or past year uh, to Wadeville and uh, <coughs> down in uh, Pekin. And so the four community buildings left will still continue to get $1,000 uh, county funds. 
Boonville, Highland Gym, both uh, a little bit of money still. Everybody else is pretty flat. We give them away our cats, uh, Humane Society, Baden EMS, um, and uh, of course the the uh, block grant for the aging and the seniors senior center, as well as NC Forestry and communities and schools, and our Southeast Partnership, who is our partner for economic development. Um, my next slide is uh, contracted services. This is a, a slight increase to a total of $3.1 million here. Um, you'll notice there are several changes here. Uh, EMS services, it's a 5% increase each year from First Health. Our landfill services from Uwari uh, Environmental also increase, has been increasing in the past few years. We're trying to catch up there. That's what they've been increasing. Uh, 20000 for for RCATs uh, is a robot grant, it's grant funded, uh, so there's revenue offset that increase. You also notice increases to our insurance for workers comp and uh, general liability. Increase in audit expense <coughs> and uh, a decrease in our legal fees and our postage meter expense. Uh, several other lines on here and our deductibles for insurance claims, Municode, um, are dues to the, uh, to the COD, PTRC. Um, and our uh, contribution to our Sand Hills Mental Health has been pretty stable for the past several years. Next slide, uh, last of the categories uh, on that uh, first sheet that showed $32.7 million total budget. And so we uh, this slide shows our extra benefits that are not budgeted in the departments, such as vacation payout and longevity, um, where we don't want to harm the departments when these things are paid, uh, so we, we budget for these items separately. Um, you'll also notice we've got some retiree insurance uh, and unemployment insurance, as well as our separation allowance for retired law enforcement officers. We're also on here, uh, we have a handful of uh, folks on the retired, receiving those benefits from retired law enforcement folks. And uh, just, it, it periodically increases, and that's why we're showing an increase to separation allowance and offsetting that with a decrease. Got uh, my unemployment insurance to show a flat in that particular category. Uh, do a few more slides here just to go over um, some general topics here. Uh, the next slide I have shows an increase in our fund balance. Back in 2000, fiscal year 2010, we ended the year with under 4% fund balance, and we're projecting, uh, still working out the numbers, of course, uh, with our auditors. But right now, we're projecting about a 50% 50, 50 fund balance as of June 30th, um, based on $32.5 million expenditures. Is estimated. Uh, that's a big improvement. Um, it's, it, we've been accumulating cash, of course, to pay for large capital expenditures uh, that, that are probably becoming due in the future. Uh, as, as Matthew has alluded to, capital needs are an iceberg. Um, and you really don't see uh, the whole picture uh, just by looking at the building. Um, and um, uh, these reserves are also uh, helpful to, to, uh, to weather the storm, so to speak, such as when the economy turns bad. Um, this is because fund balance is mostly cash and, and um, just helps us uh, get through the bad times. Um, but um, we can go into a discussion about fund balance um, in, in more detail if you like. I know uh, the LGC and the state typically ask us to keep at least 25% of expenditures on hand um, as, a, as just a goal. And that's kind of our, our commissioner goal is about 25%. And uh, happy to discuss that further. Stevie, on the fund yes, balance, I'd like to just mention as being yes, sir. possibly one of the only ones that was here at the beginning of your slide, but going from virtually a 0% fund balance the 50% fund balance and all that means. Um, back when uh, 
about 2000, I became a commissioner in 2009. 2008, I attended the budget meetings and so on. The reason the county had zero fund balance was because of overestimating revenue and underestimating expense to make the, the budget balance. So I just want to caution people of the future that fund balance can go in a heartbeat if you're not careful. Right now where we are, some of the things that has, hap have, has happened in the intervening years, one is landfill revenues have gone down by a million dollars thanks to uh, the new landfill that was opened up, to, up the road here. Uh, unexpected expenses uh, can hit you with a million dollars quickly. <coughs> Uh, back in 2009, we wanted to replace roofs on the uh, middle schools, which have been leaking ever since the schools were con uh, constructed. You go in middle schools, and if it was raining, there were waste cans in the middle of rooms catching water. We went to the LGC to borrow, I think it was uh, two million dollars to replace those roofs, and they wouldn't let us borrow even two million dollars. When we went to borrow up to $78 million for the new high school, it was done without a second thought because we had a good fund balance. So I just want to emphasize for those that are here in the future, pay attention to that fund balance and don't fritter it away needlessly. Very good point. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's, it's, it's very important, you're right, that we keep a good fund balance um, so many, for so many reasons. You can. And the, the other point is that there's a lot of uncertainty going forward from here. And I think you've done a reasonable job on estimates of both revenue and expense, but those revenue numbers can go down the tubes fairly quickly in, in the situation we're in. Okay. There's several counties in the state that are having to cut their budgets by as much as 20%, I'm told, because they don't have the fund balance to support it. Uh, yes, yeah, since, since I've come on board, uh, Matthew, uh, even before I came on board, uh, Matthew has been uh, uh, over or underestimating revenues and, and overestimating expenditures when it comes to the budget. Uh, budget's beyond where he thinks expenditures should be and budget below where you think the revenues will be um, so that we can build up on balance and, and prepare for the future. And uh, I think uh, a lot of that is, 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 is from the commissioners as well, your, your, your involvement, your leadership, and your guidance um, and, and support of that. Thank you. Um, and so uh, talking about the high school, um, that Jim, uh, Commissioner McKinney mentioned. Uh, next slide uh, goes into the educational capital fund and uh, shows from 16, fiscal year 16 and fiscal year 25. Um, shows here that uh, in fiscal year 21, we, we should be spending, uh, should be finishing the project um, and then we'll have enough money to pay the, net, the loan payments, which will start in fiscal year 22 uh, for, the, for the four years until fiscal year 25. Uh, from this fund and then as I mentioned earlier we have two uh, debts uh, expiring in fiscal year 25 for the Green Ridge Elementary and the jail and those funds would be used uh, to continue to pay uh, the debt for the USDA loan um, after that plus you'll have the 1.4 million dollars at that point more likely coming in from the five cents or the four cents of uh, the education uh, tax so it should be, should be enough to support uh, that the debt payment well into the future. Um, and that is uh, the information I plan to share today. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Matthew, I forgot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank
Well, again, we have to put these things into the ground but to emphasize that the money three or four years ago, whatever it was, we increased the tax rate by five cents. So we paid ourselves forward for debt service. So the money is in the bank to pay the debt service on the school loan. I know you said this, but I just want to emphasize it. It's not part of the fund balance. So don't be tempted to take it out of that fund and then have to raise taxes to pay the school debt from the, before the other debt comes off. Yeah, well, uh, foresight uh, was in, involved in that in that decision uh, years ago. You're right. And Commissioner Led uh, involved in that. The other couple of things about school debt, I think, going forward, is that uh, there's a chance that the interest rate on our loan with USDA will be lower than what was programmed, which would result in either being able to take a shorter term loan, paying off part of the servicing of the uh, construction in cash, or reducing the annual payment significantly. And uh, the other part of the school project, as I understand it, is that very little of the contingency fund has been used or is expected to be used, which would be another possibly couple million dollars to, to the good on the school project. Good point. Yeah, I forgot about that. You're right. Yes, um, so several million dollars, or at least two or three million dollars, there in contingency funds have not been used. Right. And, and, and if, if, in addition, we do get a lower interest rate. Right now, we're um, these are this is projected based on our 2.7 my 75 percent that we have uh, firmed up with USDA um, at our existing uh, projected loan balances. You know, 68.7 million. So you have the loan were to come down and the interest rate were offered to come down. Yeah, that would obviously, uh, yeah, you're right. That would even be, be better situation for for us. And so we're very hopeful that when we do sign that uh, loan next April, that the interest rate is lower than 2.75%. 2, 2, <coughs> 2. Okay, thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or anything for CD? Anybody? HR Director Renee Jones. Hello. I'll try not to be the horror show that Chris Hildreth made me out to be. <laughs> so as CD just said, um, at Revenue Neutral and included in that budget, we can afford to give all of our full-time employees an increase. That increase would be $1,000 annually for all the people that are making less than 50000 and 2% for the people over 50000 What I was asked to do is I was asked to prepare a presentation comparing the five surrounding counties so that we could get an idea of what we look like um, in comparison to our neighbors. Our good friends at the NCACC have a saying that when you've seen one county, you've seen one county. And that truly is true for Montgomery County because as I have been here for four years and learned and what I really learned looking at the surrounding counties is that we are truly unique. Um, my understanding is that years ago we had a wide salary range. We had a step plan. We had people in the same department doing the same job making a, a big um, range of salaries. They had a substitute pay program. And so if somebody that was long standing was here and was making a larger salary and they left, that was the advertised salary for that position. So it doesn't take much to understand that somebody new coming in could start making a, a larger salary than someone doing a similar job that had been here for a year or two. And in some cases, 
making more than a supervisor if they were lucky enough to step in to a spot that was left by someone who had been here for many years. And so what it ended up happening is we would have this big um, disparity, people doing the same job, same education level, same certification, maybe same licensing, but a different range. Um, and so what Montgomery County did is they created a scope and skill plan. And the scope and skill plan strive to hit the goal of salary equality. If you were in a clerical position in the health department or DSS or the tax department, you had the same education level, you were basically needing the same type of job skills that we were going to pay you equally. So they remodeled the step grade plan. Um, and what they came up with is a scope and skill where if you're at the same level, you're going to be paid equally. So let me show you a little bit what that looks like. Right now in Randolph County, 46% of their employees are not within their classification ranges. So what that means is they have a published pay plan, but 46% of their employees are being paid outside of that published plan. Here in Montgomery County, we only have 2% out. 98% of our employees are being paid within their range. I've got some examples to show you. A Montgomery County tax clerk, the range is 25 to 32. That's a $7,000 range. All of our tax clerks fall within that range. Nobody's outside the range. In Randolph County, the range is much greater. Look at that top end number compared to somebody coming in at the bottom. Same with our library assistants. It's a $7,000 range. In Moore County, it's much greater. Some of the disparity is huge. If you look at telecommunicators in Richmond County, it's almost double. The range is doubles. Everybody here in Montgomery County is within the range. Same for our LPNs, same for our utility techs. They're doing the same job. They're making the same pay. <clears throat> Oops. So we really are unique. And when you're trying to compare apples to apples, what I found in trying to do this comparison for you is that in a lot of ways we're comparing apples to oranges. First of all, I'm sure you can all understand that job titles vary between counties. Job responsibilities vary between counties. What you're held responsible for, what you have to do on a daily basis is going to be very varied uh, between counties. The good news is that here in Montgomery County, we've achieved that parity. We've achieved some sense of equal pay for equal job skill. And in doing so, we've also caught up with some of the other counties when we're talking about minimums. And some of my slides that are coming up will show you that a little bit better. We have some hot spots. Chris Hildreth alluded to the water treatment plant operators being a hot spot for us. We've had a hard time uh, recruiting them. But since 2013, for those hot spot employees, we've increased salaries 20%. Using our scope and skill pay classification, trying to go for equal pay for equal job, we've managed to increase and we've managed to catch up some. <clears throat> but compared to the five surrounding counties, we're still at the minimum, and I'll, and I'll show you in more detail how that's, how that's going to play out. So why am I here today? I'm here to talk about recruitment and retention, the basis of HR. Recruit talent, retain the talent that you've cultivated. Recruitment for social workers, deputies, water treatment plant operators, 911, and public health nurses has been our greatest challenge since I've been here. Issue number two, of course, retention of employees. We want to keep them. 
We don't want them to go somewhere else, particularly those that have been here for a while, that, that know our citizens and, and know their job very well. And I've been asked to try to present to you what it's going to take to address these two issues. As I move on in these slides, please understand that here at Montgomery County, we have 215 full-time positions. I've got to condense it down. And so what we've had to do is we've had to take averages and we've had to group some employees together. Anybody that wants to see the spreadsheets that we've created to do this, I'm more than happy to show you, but I don't think everybody here wants to see them. Okay. So I'm going to take these one by one. First of all, we've got deputies. All of our patrol deputies and our SROs make $32,750. If you've been here a long time, we've rewarded you with longevity. We've rewarded you with more accruals in your vacation bank. But all of them make $32,750. If you look at the five surrounding counties, there's an average there for the minimum, the mid-range, and the max. You can see how varied that is. At 911, all of our telecommunicators make $31,750. They're actually above, just a smidge, but they are above the five county minimum. But look at the max, almost $52,000. Social workers, it's another hot spot for us. Social workers have to be certified. All of our social workers, are budgeted $39,000, which is just below the surrounding county minimum. Chris Hildreth showed you our water treatment plant operators. Our average salary for them is $31,000. We only have two right now. Um, and they're right below the minimum. But that's not allowing us to attract other talent to come to Montgomery County. And this has been our hardest task lately. This has been the one that we've run the hardest to catch up with, is the public health nurses. And our average includes the LPNs, the RNs, and the BSNs. And you can, still, you can see we're still about $4,000 below the minimum. So here's my handy dandy chart to make it all easy. The positions that we just talked about, the number of positions that we have here in Montgomery County. And if you jump over the county actual average and you go to the middle of the slide, the five county minimum, you'll see that with CD's proposed budget of a thousand dollar increase and two percent over fifty thousand, we're about there. So chasing that minimum average, we've done an excellent job. We're keeping pace with it because that average moves every year. It's a moving target. If you look at the mid-range salaries, and that's the next column, those are the average for those five positions in the five um, surrounding counties. And that bottom line of 564,000 is very, very close to the five county actual salary average. So golly, what does that mean? Well, that means that most of the surrounding counties actual salary is in the mid range. And then if you look at the max, that's a lot of money. And those bottom numbers, the increase to annual cost would be from the annual cost today. So again, if we go with the proposed budget in CD's presentation, we're going to knock out that 169 in the min pretty well. We're going to keep right on target with chasing that minimum average. Now, what about the rest of the people in the county? What about them? So I've had to group them so they'd fit on my slide. Maintenance would be housekeeping, facilities maintenance, public utility tax. 
admin and directors, self-explanatory, of course, our detention center, our clerical people. Again, clerical people exist in many of the departments here in Montgomery County. They all do about the same job. They all have about the same education level. And then our supervisors. I took those positions. The next column over is the average amount that they make. And it's very, very close. In three of the five categories, you can see that the Montgomery County average and the five county minimum are very, very close. The two categories where we fall a little short is detention and clerical. We do not have trouble recruiting clerical people here in Montgomery County. When I run a clerical ad, we get sufficient applications to put somebody in one of those spots. And since we started paying overtime out at the jail, we've almost eliminated turnover. We still have some turnover, but it's not the revolving door that it was. I mean, it was to the point where I didn't even bother to file some of the files because I knew I was gonna be putting them in the termination pile in a couple of weeks. Um, so that has taken care of itself. We, we've done a, a really good job um, of stopping the revolving door down at the jail. So what does all this cost? Everybody wants to talk about cost. A lot. It costs a lot. <clears throat> Again, the proposed budget, we're going to be right on par with the minimum of the surrounding counties. If the board chooses to chase after that mid-range, we can do it in a four-year plan. You'll see there that it's going to cost us about a half a million bucks a year. But please remember that it's a moving target. We have no idea over the scope of four years what the ranges are going to be in the other counties. So the only thing I could do is deal with the numbers that I had available to me right now. But we could phase in a four-year plan at about a half a million dollars to uh, a year um, and try to get our salaries over the course of four years to more of the mid-range instead of the min-range. In summary, right now we're very close to the minimum average. That may or may not address some of the retention and recruitment issues that we have. Those five hot spot areas, we get virtually no applications. If we have more than three or four qualified applicants in a six month period for some of our nursing positions, that's exceptional. Nurses have been the fastest moving target and the hardest one for us to keep up with. But there's a national nursing shortage, even before COVID. If the board wants to push toward competitive wages, we'll need to move away from the scope and skill, equal pay for equal job program and we'll have to move back into more of a tiered program. Chris alluded to this a little bit when he talked about the different license or the different certifications in water treatment plant. So for a C certification, we'll pay this amount. For a B, we'll pay a little bit higher. And for an A, we'll pay a little bit higher. That puts us into a tier plan. Every position won't be able to work that way because some positions don't have certification. Some don't have licensing. So we'll have to drill down and look at each individual <coughs> skill set and educational requirement and build a tier plan out of that. I'll be happy to do that. I'll be happy to come back to you if that's what you direct me to do. If you don't want to go with a four-year plan, you can say, well, we're going to do so much sense. This gives you this much money to work with. And I'll be happy to go back and at your direction 
either apply that money across the board or apply it where you tell me to apply it? Are we going to apply it to the most critical need positions? It's whatever the board wishes. I'll be happy to do. It shows you there that if we fully implement the plan of going to a tier system over the course of four years, it'll add five cents ad valorem. Whether or not you direct me to do that across the board every year, or again, go to the areas that are the most needy, I'll do. So we're looking at a cent to a cent and a half ad valorem increase each year for four years to bring us up to the mid-range. And again, I caution, it's a moving target. If you go with the proposed budget, everybody sees an increase that's a full-time salary person. Can I answer any questions for you? Well, personally, I don't like the system that we're on because, like I say, if, if I've been here 10 years and you got a deputy that just comes on, he's making the same thing I am. I think that kind of is terrible. <laughs> it shows that that guy is not any more value to you. I know it's, I know it's harder to do the tier system, but like I say, it may not work for every department. But I think for the deputies and the water department, definitely. I think those two will. Uh, but let's like say it's, it's, it's all a big game. I mean, you just never know. And like you say, it is a moving target. Mm -hmm. And those salaries should move too. That's probably where we've gotten behind is those salaries hasn't, haven't increased. We haven't increased them. So they've been lagging behind and we've been getting behind by not, I guess, going along. Well, we have increased the scope and skill range every year. And in the years that I've been here, we have increased salaries at least $1,000, so for the last four. Right. I don't think we need to shoot for the minimum, uh, like proposed, because you just said yourself that most of the surrounding counties are in a mid-range. That's where they're paying, yes, So sir. it wouldn't be competitive. And I don't think that, um, just uh, uh, longevity and accruement are enough to, to, you know, to provide compensation to our employees that's been here for years. I, I agree with Commissioner Crisco that a tiered system would fit fit the needs of the departments that are hot spots right now. But I do think it needs to be looked at across the board. But that just for the sole reason of shooting for the for the minimum. Uh, when most of our surrounding counties when people can leave and make that mid-range you know if they were to get hired in a month so it, I don't I don't think that that would that would do any justice for retention so to speak I think again we're weighing two two ends against the middle one we're asking the taxpayers to uh, provide and of course taxpayers are under pressure now too with the economic situation due to the uh, pandemic. But uh, having looked at this, I would recommend that we consider it allocating two cents to the Avalon tax base. It was going from 59 and a half to 61 and a half, which would yield about $700,000, which you could apply to the hot spots and address them first. And then uh, Next year, of course, take another look at it. Madam Chair, I would offer a proposal that we consider a guidance of a 60, 61 and a half cent Avalon tax rate with the guidance to the manager in HR to uh, come back with a plan that would uh, use that $700,000 to address the key critical issues as well as see if there's any left to. I think that the other situation that we have to be guarded for is that some of our senior directors 
your paid leave, we're probably going to have to increase the salary to that. Yes, so you would. So I don't know that we would need to use the whole $700,000 immediately, but hold back a little bit. The other thing I would recommend is that a, a, a talk to is that we mentioned twice that we have not funded economic development. We don't have a fund set aside for incentives and we don't have an economic development director. I've been the county's representative to our economic development organizations for the past 12 years, which include the Piedmont Triad Partnership, and most recently, for the last four or five years, the Southeast Partnership. And the issue for Montgomery County is we're just not competitive for economic development. One reason is lack of a qualified workforce, both in terms of numbers and training level. That was one of the reasons that we put emphasis on the new high school, having a CTE building that will hopefully produce a workforce that is relevant to the needs of uh, potential industry that would come here. I, I lectured earlier about not touching fund balance, but should there be an opportunity to use fund balance to attract industry, that's certainly there. In other words, we're not turning our back on economic development. We've also reinstituted the TDA board and the tourism tax, and while tourism is an important element, it doesn't generate the type of growth that we really need to make the county prosperous, make the people in the county more prosperous, which is industry. So anyway, the bottom line is, that, like I said, I would uh, I think a two cent above revenue neutral tax rate would produce fairness both for our employees and for the taxpayers. And I would propose that, uh, again, I think what the uh, manager and uh, Renee are looking for is to understand our budget uh, process will be that uh, the budget would be published proposed annual budget for 2021, which again will be retroactive to the 1st of July, 2020. It will be published the 1st of September. So today we need to give them the guidance on whatever long tax rate we're looking at. And then we would look to pass the budget at the September board meeting. Commissioner Matheny, could you reiterate what your proposal was to HR again? To, to provide the guidance to develop a budget at a 61 and a half cent Avalon tax rate. And I don't think they would have the time between now and the next board meeting to do a good job on uh, the scope and skill, uh, looking at these critical areas as well as steps in other areas that might incentivize better retention. So if we could have that done by the November board meeting with an update in October, September yes, and October, then uh, we could pass it. It would be retroactive until 1st of July. So the bottom line, the thing we need to decide is what everyone tax rate do we want them to develop the budget for. We need to do that today, or is that yeah. critical today? Yep. If we're going to pass the budget in September. That decision needs to be made at this work session. Pardon? That needs to be made at this work session. That decision for Abalorn tax rate needs to be made right now. Right. In other words, we wouldn't be setting the tax rate. That can only be done when we pass the budget. Already. Right. We're asking, we'd be asking them to produce a budget to be published to the public on the 1st of September at an Avalon tax rate of X. X could be any number, but the numbers we talked about are 59 and a half cents for revenue neutral. In theory, the average taxpayer at revenue neutral would see no increase in their taxes from last year. So they can assess different models at, at, uh, at your proposed tax rate of uh, 61 and a half Avalon. 
Right, I'm proposing that we give them guidance to develop the budget at 61 and a half and address the pay issues for the staff as well. Okay. I share your concern with directors and supervisors, but I'm really concerned about recruitment. You can have them in place, but who are they going to supervise? You know, that's that's the hard part is trying to put, bring somebody on at minimum when they can travel to Randolph or a bordering county. Well, it's my understanding that where we have the hot spot, there would be an increase in the entry level salary. So they wouldn't be brought on at um, the, the minimum that we're looking at today. Now, I concur that um, we need to look at where we have the hot spots um, and then reward those employees that um, we're performing that revolving door because we are training and they are leaving. And in some instances, we are not getting anyone. And probably we're paying a lot of overtime that would probably pay for it an employee and somebody that might stay in the county over the long haul. However, um, I caution when we talk about econom economic development and having a director, having someone in charge of their economic development, that we take a critical look at who we bring in. Because shortly after I came to the state, we had someone in place that went and brought, tried to bring fiber watt into the county. And that was a big, big mess. If it had come in, we probably would have killed off half the old people in the county. So we need to make sure that when we have folks doing these kinds of things, that they create, take a critical look at the industries that they want to bring into the county. I'm not against having economic development, but we don't need um, folks that go around and see what they call beautiful, aesthetically pleasing type activities that they think will bring money into the county, bring jobs into the county, and it end up hurting our people. And that way. If we were to go along with a two cent tax increase, could you present us with what uh, salaries mid minimum and average would be for those critical areas that we are referring to? So you're talking about a two cent increase to and you want to apply it to the hot spots? I'd be happy to prepare some things for you. I think that's I think, and to be clear that it's gonna take time to really Absolutely. do a quality job on this. So Today or next, even next board meeting, they're not going to be able to say, okay, here's the answer. If we study all the data and, and do a good job on it. I mean, they can, we'll have time, I think, over, this be in August, September, October, November, over the next three months, to work with HR and the manager to come up with a plan that would be acceptable to the commissioners as far as uh, how the additional money is allocated. And I don't think they're prepared today to say it would be allocated in this manner. No, because again, we worked with averages, and even within the public health nurse slide, there's several different layers in there. And so what I would want to do is go back to the director and, and speak specifically with her as far as the job responsibilities and what level of education and licensing she has to have for each one. Today's presentation was really about averages. I still would like to see the county move to an across the board uh, tier system eventually. I mean, I know that can't happen overnight or in a month or two months, but I do think that would, that would address retention and uh, specifically retention and recruitment. You know, that's I hear it all the time. 
especially from deputy sheriffs. I'm 14 years here and I was making 32750 compared to a new hire. Brought in the same thing. I know it goes back to same job, same pay scale, same pay. But I would I would you know I would I would just venture to say I don't think that's fair. Well, I've seen a tier system work both ways. I've been in organizations or seen or competitive organizations when I was in private business where secretaries were making more than their bosses because of longevity pay raises. And uh, so, I mean, there's more to a tier system than just a step system like civil service, whereas if you're living and breathing two years from now, you're going to get a pay raise. Sorry, Mike, I didn't mean Hey, I like it. At least I know where I'll be. Right. But it does cause, and, and what you're saying, it does cause for laziness because, like I say, you know you're going to get it, but in that situation, if you bring in a C plant water operator and he progresses to a B, then that should move him to another tier. He will, you know, he's, and that's he, an easy one. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing, if he moves, gets to another uh, level, then he moves to another tier. And sooner or later, he will kind of max out. But if you're giving cost of living raises alone, then he stays ahead. He don't he don't lag back with the like say somebody just come on is making the same thing. Well, in my view, this would get us huge to get us closer to being up on the step. And then, I mean, we've fought this battle ever since I've been here for 12 years, basically. Again, back in the beginning, the first year I was here, what we had to do was actually furlough people or tell people to take days off and reduce their pay in order to balance the books. But um, again, looking at it from the taxpayer's viewpoint, uh, I think our employees have done a great job, our management has done a great job in holding costs. Uh, as we've seen, the operating costs have not increased we have increased salaries by about 20% over the last seven years, which again is not uh, not quite equal to cost of living increases. But if we could get up on the step and then do cost of living increases, I think we'd be in a better position. I think we'd be treating the taxpayers fairly. I agree. I, I, and I do think what if if we started out in that direction you would, if we move to a tier base eventually over time, you would begin to incentivize employees that work for the county uh, that are pursuing education to better their career. And when they get extra credentials, they can be, you know, uh, uh, qualified for a higher pay scale. And right now, is, does that exist in the county? Do, you know, as far as if deputies were to go out and receive extra training and certifications or DSS, uh, uh, employees or DSS social workers go out and, and seek after extra extra school or extra trainings. Do they get more pay based on the qualifications that they bring to the table? Not at this time. No. So then you then then I just think that it's critical that we find a way to incentivize a better service for the citizens in the county. That's how we can you know that's how we can recruit better employees to provide a better service in the long term. Now there are exceptions, and you know I won't get into the weeds here with the exceptions, but. You know, certainly if you're an LPN right. and then you become an RN, oh, you're going to jump the scope and skill class. And yes. so there are some opportunities, but there are not the opportunities. I, I think what you're saying, Commissioner, is if I get a certification which allows me to do something extra, say, in the scope of law enforcement, then that should be worth something. Right. Um, and right now, we don't have a lot of that. I mean, I understand trying to be equitable for the taxpayer, but if we're just paying our employees to provide the bare amount of service, are we really doing them any favors? You know, if we can't incentivize their 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 public servants to to seek greater education to serve them better, then you know, I just have a little, just a little bit of an issue with that. And you know, I've been here four years. Commissioner Matheny says he's been here twelve, and so he saw those really hard times. Mm -hmm. All I can see is you know history yeah. and then go on what I have experienced in my time here. And I have open personnel files back when you're discussing Commissioner Matheny where people had to take furloughs and people didn't see increases for six, seven or eight years, right. nothing at all. And we have increased salaries the last seven years and we have caught up. We were farther behind 
Mm -hmm. um, so I suppose if the com you know if the board wishes to add a couple more cents to the tax base, then we can try to move ahead even further. It, it's not like we have been standing still or losing ground. We've actually gained ground. You may not be able to see it, yes. but we have gained ground. The concern I have is when we talk about averages and we talk about, you know, certain disciplines, there should be, an, and this will take time to do, this isn't something that we, we can just say we're going to move on tomorrow, but it, it will take time. And one of the things that we can do is set up an, a grid or a pay system. If, if you want to give people increments, you can set up a pay system whereby you have an entry level pay. And then you move up through the ranks. Maybe one to four years you get a, with a pay grade. And then four to seven, five to seven, there's another pay. And then um, seven to ten. And then you max out. But you know, this takes time and it also takes money. And it isn't something we can do overnight. The thing is, is that when I hear that you bring a brand new deputy in. I'm just using this as an, as an example. You bring a brand new deputy in, and he or she's making the same money that a 10-year veteran is making. Mm -hmm. There's a misnomer there, because that brand new deputy should come in at an entry level, because they have no training um, in, 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 in this particular county. Mm -hmm. And so they shouldn't be at the same pay as a 10-year mm -hmm. person, um, which means that they'll be making less money when they come on board. Right. Because you can't, you, you, it, it, it's, you just can't afford to bring them in at a higher, a much higher grade and then continue to give them increments year after year after year because you would have a taxpayer revoke mm -hmm. and that we don't need. <laughs> So it's kind of like a gradual tier system is what you're speaking, speaking about. Well, it's, it's, it's similar to what the federal government uses. Yeah. You know, you got an entry-level position, and then you get an entry-level position in certain disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, an engineer will make more than a soil conservationist, or a biologist would make more than a forester, right. because that's the uh, <coughs> discipline that they're in, and it's based on discipline. I mean, there are there are tons of examples you can use. Like you know, I work I work for the school system, school system teacher. You know, PPI has their pay scale plain as day. Bachelor's degree makes this zero year zero, and, and scale goes all the way up to 20 years. But from like 15 to 22, it stays the same. But you make more if you have your national board certification. If you have your master's degree, you make more. I mean, there are you know so many different examples you can use. But I do think it would be worthwhile to just examine one, but I believe it starts with what uh, Commissioner Matheny said is with an ad valorem tax increase in order to uh, in order to establish the first step, so to speak, before you jump into it. Yeah. And Frank, well, I think what we're talking about is a step program that's either based on merit or longevity. I think those different criteria will be applied to different positions. Like you said, a water plant operator who we want to get the highest certification who is content to stay at the lowest certification maybe shouldn't get a step increase. That's right. You and one of 13 road deputies so however many we have who has gained knowledge and experience maybe does get a step increase based on longevity. Anyway, these are the things that they need to, to look at and come back with if we decide to do that. Okay. If we decide not to, then I think we're all in agreement that the, the, uh, we want to proceed with the 2% increase, the 1,000 slash 2% increase. It's already factored into this proposed budget. So again, Madam Chair, I would move uh, that our guidance be for 61 and a half cent Avalon tax rate for the budget development. Okay. 
So we just are making a recommendation to ask for this study to be done at this time. We don't vote on anything during the work session, but we're asking that the study be done. And then you come back to us with the study and we'll discuss it. But that's what is, everybody's in agreement then to ask for this. To, right. to be clear, the budget will be passed before they complete their study. Oh, yeah. Because they don't have time. Uh, so what we don't want to do is have them come in to the September meeting and say, we've changed their mind. We want the other one to actually to be 59 cents. And so to be clear, so I know what I'm going to propose. You're you going to create magic. That's what you're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> if only I could. If I could plant a money tree, it would solve all of our problems. My understanding, based on what I've heard, is that the budget that CD proposed, so everybody has that, and then the extra, you want to see how we could apply it to the hot spots and maybe certain other positions hold some in reserve. Right. Is that my understanding? Is it correct? Right. Definitely to the hot spots. Definitely to the hot spots. Yes. Okay. Cold water on the hot spots. <laughs> Because we also you know, need to look at the retention piece, too, as well as the recruitment piece. Yes. Because, like the sheriff said, he's losing deputies. So if we look at the retention piece, maybe they won't be going to another county, as well as the social workers leaving to go to other counties. So I think first what we're saying is look at the hot spots. Is that what I'm hearing? And then yes. we look at the retention piece and see what we can do. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'll do it. Thank Anything you. else or any other comments or questions with this? We need a little vote. No, we don't vote the during the work session. Mm -hmm. We don't vote during the work session. Well, we vote that we all agree with that guidance. Everybody agree with that guidance? Mm -hmm. Anybody oppose it? Okay. Okay, I have my guidance. As long as we Thank you. Enough time to do it. I'll do my best. Thank you. If you need some help, you can holler. I will. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Our next item on the agenda calls for any questions for the staff before the sheriff comes forward. You want to have questions for the staff? I'll just make one other comment. Renee, the other aspect, of course, of uh, recruitment and, and retention is job satisfaction. So over the next two or three months, if you would take a look at how we, I know in organizations, particularly when we're busy, having been in many of them, that sometimes we tend to overlook uh, employee job satisfaction with certain things like training and uh, goal setting and uh, performance recognition and so on. So if you just kind of look and see where we are in those areas and see if there are things that can be done. Yes, sir, I'll do it. And Renee, what, on, that, on that note, can we place an emphasis on exit interviews to see, we, we wanna, I wanna know, I think the board wishes to address the reason why we are losing employees, if it is salary, if it's whatever that reason may be. I just think we need to place a, 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 a heightened emphasis on exit interviews. May I speak to that? Please, by all means. I'd like to speak to that too. Okay, you're first. I think it stinks. <laughs> because what happens in an exit interview is that a person's going to say what you think they want to say. And you're not going to get the truth. Plus the fact, if they have an opportunity to come back to you and your supervisor, if, if it, the the, pre, the new employee have an opportunity to come back to your um, former supervisor and they tell you what they said, that might impact the job later on down the road. So I, I never, I was never in favor of um, exit interviews. And um, there were situations at one location where the person left an exit letter and all he did was criticize all the employees in the office. Mm. I like to have the opportunity to form my own opinion about the employees that I work with, the ones that I supervise. So I'm not in favor of exit interviews. I think a lot of it has to do with, depends on who actually gives the exit interview. You don't want the, 
the person leaving to have to do that interview with their director or supervisor by no stretch of imagination. So it does, I mean, you, you, you might, getting any clear information might not always be uh, the best avenue, but it does give you information nonetheless. So. I have habitually done an exit interview mm -hmm. unless an employee refuses to come and meet with me. Okay. Um, sometimes they don't want to come. And Commissioner Mack, you are correct. I've been in HR for several decades. Sometimes you get an excellent exit interview because an employee truly understands that they can't have everything that they want and that nobody is perfect. And so I would say maybe 20 to 30 percent of the time in my career I've gotten a very good or excellent exit interview. Unfortunately, I've also had lousy exit interviews where I know that an employee has an ax to grind about one thing or the other and they come into my office and we start the questions and it's like, oh yeah, everything was great. Mm -hmm. Everything was great. I'm just going to make more money somewhere else. And I know that's not true. So I always try to gauge what I know about that employee and that's one of the reasons that I like working so much in Montgomery County is because I know every employee by name. And I know something about every employee. Certainly I know some better than others. But nobody's just a number to me. Um, and so I do hope that when they come in and they talk with me during an exit interview, it's not, well, now tell me, uh, and it's question after question. I try to engage them in conversation because when people relax and they talk to you, um, you can usually find some of the real reasons as to why they're leaving. But I will put an extra emphasis on that, and I'm happy to talk with you anytime okay. um, you have a particular concern about an employee. Well, it's just, it's, you know, not a specific employee. It's just something that the board can do. And we want to do it. You know, we, we're, Russell, we we're trying to address those issues of retention. But have we ever um, issued any, like, job satisfaction surveys or anything like that to be paired with those exit interviews? Since I've been here, we have not put out any job satisfaction interview. I know that uh, I know a lot of HR directors have done like a monkey survey. Um, so it's very anonymous. You know, you can't know their handwriting. You can't know what department it was from because it's all done on the internet. Um, and we might do something like that because the data can be pulled off of there very quickly. Yeah. The caution is, of course, what the climate is at the time that you put out the survey. If the climate with the employees is, I didn't get a raise this year, they're not happy about anything. <laughs> so, yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, well, given the alarming turnover rate, some sort of anon anonymous survey might do, uh, you know, it, it might serve to, uh, to gain some knowledge about what's going on. As long as we take the data with a grain of salt. That's it. That's it. You got to take the good with the bad. Anything else? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Anything else for staff? I see several department heads out there. Anybody have any questions for anybody else? Staff, any questions to us? Hmm? Does the staff have any questions to us? Rhonda, you, you're going to be busy in a couple, few months. You got everything you, you need as far as COVID supplies to make sure our polls are going to be safe. And Fortunately, um, here, um, Rhonda Johnson, board of um, we were given um, a $48,000 grant from the CARES Act fund. I don't know if anybody knew that. But we've been given a $48,000 grant, so we're going to be able to have everything that we need at our precincts. Um, we're going to have masks. We're going to have hand sanitizer. We're going to have a safety person at the door. We're going to uh, keep a six-foot line. The poll workers in our county, the other, just forget what you heard on the news. Our county poll workers have agreed to come back. I've got four that haven't. So yay for Montgomery, dedicated poor workers. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to have all kind of safety things 
at the polls for the voter as well as for the workers. So you do, everything you're hearing about absentee by mail, it's a good thing if you're afraid of corona, but the polls will be open. If you like to go out, we're still going to have it. It's going to be safe. So, And the good news for our county, we've got a lot of money there that we can do things with. We're going to try to try to use it all, mm -hmm. and you all won't have to worry about paying for it. You won't have good. to worry about paying extra to employees to help us. Okay. That's covered. Well, thank you for keeping the voter safety at, at, at your best interest. I mean, I'm glad to hear that. A lot of people ask about absentee voting and stuff. I'm going to tell them, hey, we, we got, we're going to make sure that's going to be safe to vote here. It is. It might alleviate some of that absentee ballot rush you're going to get over the next well, few weeks. Well, we, we have got, we have received 250,000 so far. We can't send out ballots to September the 4th, but we've already got over 250. Uh, did I say thousand? You I'm did. Sorry. I was going to say we. I am we, so sorry. We just grew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to be working twenty more days. No, we've got two hundred and fifty so far. Wow. And we can't send them out till September the fourth. So you can imagine what we're going to have by yeah September October. Okay. But again, the grant money is going to pay for the postage. Nothing yep. coming off the county. So. Well, thank you, ma'am. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, anything else? <coughs> okay, if not, then I think the sheriff is up next. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm sorry I wasn't here all day, and I appreciate y'all rearranging the agenda a little bit, allow me to get Susan to Chapel Hill. So. Thank you for the time and for the opportunity to speak with you. I think this marks the sixth year that I've been in budget opportunities. And those of you who have been here this entire time generally know that I come and come with a calm voice and come with reason and saying the incremental steps and we're moving forward and small things and you know, keep progressing. You may remember back earlier this year when I was before you, that was my theme at that time that the things that we've been doing are right and let's keep on the right track and keep moving forward. Since that time, there's been a change in the climate. The climate, of course, is COVID-19 and it's national unrest. Both of those have occurred this year and both of those have impacted law enforcement greatly throughout the nation, throughout the state, and here in this county. And that impact is that fewer people are staying in law enforcement. Many of them that are eligible to retire have done so, as well as here in Montgomery County. Several that are in law enforcement have left to find jobs outside of government because of the rebound after the government got back to work and the economy got better. There was a lot of people in local law enforcement that got better jobs driving a truck. And of course, the number of BLTs occurring throughout our community college system in North Carolina have diminished over the years in many community colleges have not been able to have enough students to keep a BLET program. So when you factor all that together and you realize that every law enforcement agency has to hire someone that has completed the basic law enforcement training before we can hire them, you run into a supply and demand issue. And so in a short distance, we ran into that. I came to the manager six, seven weeks ago and spoke with him about this, him and the human resource director, and notified them that in my 39 years, this is the first time that I've seen a real huge supply and demand issue. And forecasting the future is gonna get bleaker before it gets better. Basic law enforcement academies, whether they're ran by the state or ran by the local community college, we can only pull ours from the community college. As I said, that has diminished over time. Fewer colleges are providing people through that program. The program runs for about 16 or 17 weeks, and we, we know the last program was halted in the middle of the program for COVID-19. They were able to finish, and we're happy for that. But as they begin a new program, and as others begin other programs, over a 16 or 17 week period, there's likelihood there's gonna be an interruption of an outbreak on that campus. When that happens, that program's gonna cease. So as you can see, there's gonna be delays. Here in Montgomery County in 1981, when I started, the same problems we have now, same problems we had then. 
we were competing with counties around us that were more lucrative. We were competing with counties around us that had a higher population, had a higher tax base. And we trained a lot of people that stayed here their entire 30 years and retired. And we trained a lot of people that stayed here long enough to find a job elsewhere. That environment's still going on. We relied then as we relied up until the recent future, or excuse me, the recent past, we relied on the community college to provide us trained people whether that was from Richmond Community College or Stanley Community College or Montgomery, we realized that Montgomery County may not be the place that somebody's going to do 30 years at. We realized that they may be here three or four. And for those people, I'm very grateful for it. They do you a good job. But you also realize that somebody's going to take their place and they're going to come through that system. The last class that graduated from Montgomery Community College had 11 people in it. That's a good size class for a small county. The problem with that, nine of those students weren't from this county, only two. So now you realize that the numbers are not going to replace the numbers that we're losing. Coupled with that, all the counties around us have increased their salaries exponentially. Many of them have already passed their budgets, went into effect July, and they began recruiting immediately with higher wages than what they had to begin with, which was higher than ours. So the discussion I had with the manager and with the personnel with the HR was that we don't have anybody that we can recruit. We put a job posting on the internet, we get no results. We call, we cannot recruit. We did a survey at the request of the manager. What are we looking like with other counties? What are we looking like with the towns within this county? And I'm here to tell you, we're at the bottom of that. We're not even competing with the towns in the county. They're slightly, not huge, but slightly above us. But when you're talking to someone, you say, Mike, would you like to come work for me? It's a $500 cut. The word cut puts a stop on that, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. It's $500, but the word cut puts a stop on it. You might love me like Peter Love Paul, but for $500, you probably won't stay where you're at. So many times, the towns around us are paying just slightly more, but it means that we're not competitive. But when it comes to the counties around us, we're missing the mark hugely. Mr. Mack, you made a lot of comments about merit or, or, or job performance and grade, inc grade increases. Mm -hmm. I, I support that wholeheartedly. But you talked also about the minimum salary that somebody shouldn't be making what they're making when somebody else has been doing that job for the past eight years. No, what? Uh, what? What I, you, you hire what, someone that comes in making the same as the guy that's been there. No, what I'm saying is is that there should be an entry level salary. Mm -hmm. And if you give an entry level entry level salary and the person that's been on the job has progressed, then that entry level salary should not be equivalent to the person that's been there ten years. That, that's what, that's I'm, what saying. I'm saying. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I think we're on the same page. You okay. shouldn't pay right. you shouldn't pay the new person the same as what somebody's been there eight years. Right, right. I agree with that. Okay. Problem of it is, is that our entry level salary of thirty two seven five, thirty two thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars is nowhere near the entry level salary of anybody around us. When you can go to Randolph County and get a $10,000 raise entry level, that's what I'm talking about. Well, we had something else called locale pay. I, uh, yeah, I understand. All of that, all of that is, is doable, and, and all of that is necessary right. to retain people. But I don't want us to get confused talking about, you know, that we could have step this and step that. What I'm telling you is I can't get anybody at 32750 that's what I'm telling you. I'm looking you now and telling you, we're not going to get any deputies at 32750 I'm advertising for it. I'm getting zero applicants. We're advertising on the Internet. We're getting zero applicants. The tension's a little bit better. We've put in some paid overtime. That's helped. With the tension, I can hire you today and put you to work tonight. You've got to finish the school within a year. But with law enforcement, I can't do that. So my ability to cultivate is a little bit easier in the detention world. I can recruit, I can cultivate, I can mold Harvey Mack into a detention officer, I can put him to work, and he may not like that, and he may do a career there. I can't mold someone that has to go through a 16-week program prior to me getting them, you understand? 
So the ability to recruit in the law enforcement field is hampered by the fact that you got to have a certification before you step into that job. Is that state mandated? It's state mandated. Yeah. See, my problem with the state mandate and a lot of this stuff, they should have to help pay for it. Because well, they, little counties like us, I mean, Charlotte and Greensboro, same mandate yeah. I get, they got plenty of money. But somebody that's like us and the state sitting over there making rules for little us, you know, it's, it's a lot different. I, I see your point, but, mm -hmm. but that didn't change the, the game <laughs> I'm playing. Yeah, yeah I understand uh, that. And so I am here to tell you, I've not stood ever, I've never stood in front of you all and said, I've got, an, I've got a fire alarm I'm ringing. I think I've come to discuss things with you, told you what the lay of the land was, but I'm telling you, there's a fire alarm ringing. And that is that we don't have the ability to recruit. Currently, right now, I have seven pending or current or pending openings. Two of those in detention, five are in law enforcement. One was due to a death, one was due to a retirement, one was due to being terminated, two went to other agencies. So it's a hodgepodge of reasons. The two that went to other agencies was money. The other retired, what I talked to you about to begin with, people are leaving. Of course, the death is COVID. So there's a whole mixture of things here, but the bottom line is I can make a lot of things, but I can't make a deputy. So I come before you and I say this, that you have a, a difficult task ahead of you. You've got to come up with a budget. That budget has to look after the operations of the county, and I know that each and every man that works for this county does it and does it well, and each and every one of them deserve and need extra funds and their department heads need that to be able to keep, recruit, retain, qualified people, and let's stop the turnover. But I'm also telling you that when there's not enough deputies to answer a call, your phone's gonna ring just as quick as mine will. So I encourage you to realize where the tip of the spear is at when it comes to service and realize what it's gonna take. And this is not about being a little bit here, a little bit there, it's just the the environment that we're in, the timing that we're in, and some of these other counties have already passed their budget, we're behind. And we have made incremental steps, and it does take time. And one of the things that we did when I got here, there was no rhyme or reason, Mr. Mack, to anybody's salary. You had a deputy that was doing this job, was highest paid, and had the lowest responsibility. This deputy over here was doing the hardest work, highest responsibility, was the lowest paid. We went through a through attrition we, and moving people around, we went through a, a creating billets, and those billets were filled with people based on knowledge, skill, and ability. And their pay was based on their responsibility and difficulty of doing the job so that a school resource officer was not making what a detective made. And so we did all that. The problem of it is, is we've not had the funding to do performance evaluations. We've not had the funding to do those kind of things, and they're important. But right now, we're not talking about performance. We're talking about being able to hire somebody. We have asked, as part of our budget process, uh, we have asked HR to go ahead, and that's one of the hot spots that we talked about was the deputies. We've asked them to go ahead and get a study with the proposal ready for us to look at what kind of salaries to look at, the change in the afterworm tax. But not at the same tax rate, at a two, at a two cent tax increase. So right. I, to be honest with you, looking at what we have going on in the counties around us, and I can't compare us to Green County. It might be exactly the same, but Green County's got cornfields all around it. Yeah. I've got Ashboro, I've got Southern Pine, Pinehurst, Albemarle. That's what I've got around me, not cornfields. Randolph, Stanley, and all exactly. those counties, what we're yeah. looking at. And so we're, we're really we're talking, talking about anywhere between 16 and 20 percent increase for deputies to be to hire somebody. That's what I was going to ask, Chris. What kind of starting pay would you? $38,000, $39,000. We're not going to be competitive. If, I mean, if you're asking me, well, we're going to make sodas and we're going to break into the market and we're going to stock them in convenience stores, and you're asking me what's it going to take to make that happen, that's what it's going to take. Thirty-eight to 39000 we're not going to make a bump in the road anything and less we're than that. we're at 32750 And that was good up until six months ago. This is an anomaly that has just happened. It's a 
change in the entire climate. It's a change in the climate. It's a change in the, in the culture. It's a change in job satisfaction throughout the nation. Don't think that Asheboro is all rosy or that Stanley County is all rosy. If it was rosy, they wouldn't have needed our people. So you, you understand what I'm saying? So your professional opinion was this pay scale disparity didn't exist six months ago. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as great. They were some, we, we were competitive a year ago, six months ago. We were competitive. But again, there has been mass changes in the counties around us with their pay. And I can understand why. Yeah. And again, you know, if if those counties, you know, they got the same problem we got, or they wouldn't be asking for our people. There's no doubt about it. No, if Ashburn's filling openings with well, our people, it's because somebody left Ashburn. That's right. You'd have to ask him why they left. Did they retire? Did they quit? Did they go to Greensboro? There's a migration. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, it's supply and demand. How many uh, vacancies are there among the towns? You know? I think Troy's got about two or three. Last time I talked to the chief there, Bisco has none because they took one of ours. Mountain Gillette has none because they took one of ours. And the first that started so the Star's not had any turnover, and I don't know how long. We need to find out what they're doing right, then, don't we? Not a whole lot doing star. <laughs> it, 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 what they're doing right is not, I mean, no offense to star, just not a whole lot yeah, of activity. Bottom line. Well, I think somebody that goes into law enforcement needs a, a psyche uh, evaluation anyway. I don't, I don't know who would, in their right mind, would want to, like you say, in this climate, would want to get into law enforcement. Well, Mike's there. right. I'm a teacher with a criminal justice degree. Yeah. One from MCC, one from FICA. I just wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. it yeah. It's, well, I think we've, We've talked. It, all, all the jobs are important in the county. Absolutely. The nurse, the convenience site worker, the water plant operator, all of them are important. It takes a it takes a village to make it run, and I respect that. Uh, but what I am saying is there is not a an ample supply of people to pick from in the in out here as it may be for these other jobs due to certification. And I, nurses are probably the same thing. You know. Uh, water plant operator probably the same thing. It's a rare breed, and people may not be certified to do that. Yeah, I agree. I just got I work for a school system. I make more than a starting deputy, or a deputy that's been there, you know, 10, 12 years, like you were saying. And I don't think that's right. I do think that we, we need to address their, their starting salary here. And uh, But I, I would like to see over time, I do think it would help with retention. Um, I mean, I, I take your opinion, you know, respectfully, but I do think that a tier system for those deputies with longevity that don't have the detective status I, or, or rank status should be paid more. I, I cannot disagree with you. The problem of it is, is that's not going to fix the problem of the entry level salary. Yeah. Right now, right. we're talking about entry level salary. And so, what you're saying is, if we raise salaries to, to 38.5 tonight, then we're going to have to raise them even more to get that person in that tier system. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but what I'm saying is uh, I'd, I'd love to do that. I think it would help with retention. I'm sitting here talking about recruitment and the ability to hire a certified person that has an acceptable record that we can hire that needs to be wearing a gun and badge answering your door at 3 in the morning. I don't have anybody. You need more people now. Yeah, a tier Yesterday. system isn't an overnight fix, but a, yeah. an entry pay rate we could address sooner than later. Yeah. Is there any other questions? I'll be happy to answer. Well, so, I mean, the fact is we can't set the entry rate without adjusting all the other salaries. So I think you're years. talking about raising the base rates on all the all the positions. Yeah. yeah. You're talking about raising the base rates on all the positions. Right. Yes. What about detention? Detention is is is. You're going to stick your finger in one leaky hole and it's going to squirt out the other hole. I think both of them need to be addressed. Well, you said uh, patrol or deputy 32750 to, let's just say, 38. Um, let's do detention. What are we looking at? They're at 28.5 now. Uh, I, I'd apply the same percentage to it, whatever the percentage okay. is. If you go to 38, you're probably talking about a 16% raise. Do you have anyone in, in your detention system that can move into the deputy? No, sir. Okay. Is they're not required out? to take them. They're not the it's, a it's a different school. Yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay. 
Yeah. Some of the counties have done that, and what they've done is hired certified BLET people for detention and then let them go into other, have that opportunity to ebb and flow. For example, in Guilford County, if you want a job in Guilford County Sheriff's Department, you have to be BLET certified. You will probably start at the detention center. At the detention center, you're making the same as the deputy, but the deputy gets a take-home car and you don't. The deputy gets 5% of 401k and you don't. And if you like being inside, that might be the job for you. If you like being outside. So there is ability to move people like chess pieces in Guilford County and Alamance as well. There's some of those that address that. Uh, but we, we are, because of past cost saving, we've, we've went of dividing detention, certified detention officers and certified law enforcement officers. You know, Just trying to find an escape for you. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, from a, com, uh, and you're the sheriff and why I'm asking you to do this, but from a commissioner standpoint, if we were to adjust the raises, uh, adjust the entry level pay for your deputies, you know what the other department heads are going to say to us? You're asking me to know what they're going to think. I don't, I don't either. But I'm saying if you were a DSS social worker and oh, your entry level wasn't competitive, you would be singing the same song. Absolutely. Okay. Because that's just something we have to consider. You know, we have a lot of other departments that have the same issue. But again, not to the level of severity that your department is facing. And I fully acknowledge that. But that's just something that we have to well, take into consideration. I respect theirs as well. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's no doubt. I'm sure that Ms. Smith has just as much problem finding people. I'm sure that Ms. Baldwin has just as much fi trouble yeah. finding people. Absolutely. Uh, and, and so the bottom line is we got this slightly behind at a bad time. It's nobody's fault. You can't blame anybody. It's not the department head's fault, not the manager's fault, certainly not the commissioner's fault. It's just time. So that don't make the, the weight any lighter on your shoulders to make the decision, but you do have some opportunities here. You've got reevaluation. We haven't had tax increases in a long time. I think the overwhelming majority of the people support what's being done. If you think back, when we built a school, there was a five cent increase. Everybody said they're gonna fill the room up. I don't recall a single person being here. Not one single person. And so I encourage you to do what's right and not politically correct. Just do what's right. Everybody's got a budget at home. You've got one, you've got one, you've got one, I've got one, you've got one. we all got a budget. Sometimes we have to work a little harder and get a better paying job, or we have to get a second job or whatever to make revenue come in to be able to meet the needs of our household. And that burden is on y'all. And I've, I've had that burden at the town of Troy 15 years as a commissioner there. So I know it's a burden, but sometimes you just have to do what's right and not politically correct. It's not easy. No one in this room, no department head says this is easy. But not finding people that we can qualify, people that we can keep and care for our people, care for our children, care for our older folks, make sure that the nursing homes and the daycares are clean, and make sure that the restaurants are cared and the inmates are cared for and the warrants are served and people are saving their homes. It's not easy to find those folks. Yeah. And so our burden is just as equally tough as yours. And so it's not a he said or he she said or us person. We're all in this together. So I encourage you, think hard, pray on it, make the right decision based on the needs, the finances. And I think the county's not going to hold you in, in any, any less, you know, esteem for what you've done. In fact, that's what they've hired you to do, make the right decisions to keep the county going. They don't want us bankrupt. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Sharon. Well, that completes our agenda for the work session. So we will adjourn our work session and we have the Consolidated Board of Health and Human Services that begins like in right now. <laughs> Minus two minutes. <laughs> we'll take a five minute break. Yeah.